Good afternoon. One of the most exciting stories in all of English, English literature is that of the story of King Arthur. Now, I, this story was made famous by Robert Mallory and Alfred Lord Tennyson. And scholars debate whether or not a real King Arthur ever even existed. But to good Anglo-Saxons, that is beside the point. The point is, King Arthur, to borrow a modern phrase, is the man. Now, not only was King Arthur famous, but most of us, whether we've read the stories or not, we know the people that he hung out with. Again, to borrow another modern phrase, it was men like Merlin the Wizard. It was the faithful and heroic Knights of the Round Table. But one of the more interesting elements of the King Arthur story is that of his sword, Excalibur. Now, Excalibur was no ordinary sword. This sword supposedly had a scabbard that would protect its user from specific injuries. The first time Arthur ever unsheathed his sword, its brightness blinded 30 of his enemies where they could not even see. This was no ordinary sword. This sword was special. Well, brothers in the congregation, I want you to use your imagination with me for just a few moments. Suppose that you receive warning that your family is going to be soon attacked. And not just attacked by a common petty thief, but attacked by an enemy that no one has ever stopped. Your family is going to be attacked and no gun and or no knife has stopped the one who will do the attacking. But you also find out one thing. There is one weapon that will protect you and protect your family. The sword Excalibur. Well, whether it's legend or not, you're going to be motivated to find that sword. If you knew that, it, that your family's life was in danger and you either must find that sword or you would all perish, you would do everything in your power to find whatever you needed to find in order to defend your family. You would investigate what all has happened to that sword from the time of King Arthur all the way down to this very present day. Well, brothers, the situation we face in this life is greater than any legend, and it is more deadly than the stories of King Arthur. Our families are under attack from an enemy we cannot see. Our enemy is diabolical. He is wicked beyond all understanding. And he would destroy us if he was allowed, but we have been given a weapon greater than Excalibur, greater than any human-made weapon ever. And that is the sword of the Spirit of Almighty God. That is our weapon. This conference is the story of God sovereignly preserving the sword of the Spirit throughout history so that when the enemy attacks, we are not left defenseless, but rather we bear His sword and we may, by His Spirit, tear down all things that exalt themselves against His knowledge and all strongholds that are not built on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And we should faithfully make known to others that He has revealed His Word to men and He has guarded that Word from error throughout all the ages. Now, it would be easy to say, 
does it really matter how God's Word got here as long as we have it? As long as it's here, what's the big deal about its history? But if you were challenged by someone who, who says, that book is full of lies and full of contradictions and full of errors, how would you respond? when you don't have a resident expert who you can just contact briefly and say, let me get back to you on that. If you're challenged to defend why you believe God's Word is God's Word, how would you answer? And that is what we are here for this weekend. Can you give a reasoned defense of why you believe you hold within your possession the revelation of God to men? This afternoon, I want us to identify four reasons why it is important to know the history of the Bible. This will be, on one, in one sense, probably the least technical talk of this conference. But just because it has less technical information does not mean... The first reason that the history of the Holy Scriptures is important is because it validates the cl its claim to be God's Word. And the first reason is that it validates, the, its history validates its claim to be God's Word. Now, before I proceed, let me say that the validity of God's Word does not ebb and flow with the latest archaeological discovery. God's Word is God's Word, and no matter what any man says, that will not change, because God said it, and not men. God has promised, He has said within the canon, that His Word will never change, that it will not pass away. But just because God promised, to guard His Word does not mean that we neglect the way He has chosen to fulfill that promise. We don't, we don't base our beliefs of the inspiration of God's Word on empirical proofs. But this does not mean that proof isn't important. Now, in the early 20th century, sadly, many fundamentalist conservatives took this stance. They said, what does it matter if a few liberal scholars critique the Bible? They're not going to change what I believe. But in taking that stance, many who believe in the divine inspiration of God's Word have withdrawn from textual academic study. And they've handed the study of the biblical text over to the secular academy. It, it, it's like this. Imagine you have a gold mine. You've tested the gold. You know that the gold you have is pure gold. It is the real thing. And because you're confident that what you have in your mind is pure gold, you sell your gold testing equipment to your opponent who says that you're a liar and you don't have the real thing. Should you do that even though you know you have the real gold? No. In this area, the church of Jesus Christ has abandoned its calling to engage the world as salt and light. The result has been that our culture this to this day only hears from one side of the debate. They only hear from the side that says God's Word is not inspired and it is not true. And as Brother Mike said, we pray that the Lord will raise up those who will enter into this field and faithfully proclaim that God's Word is true because He said it's true and by His grace and mercy we will display the proofs that say that it is God's Word. And new discoveries are made continuously in the area of biblical history. 
And thankfully, our faith is not based, or excuse me, our, our faith is not based on what fallen men say about what they have discovered. We don't rely on man's interpretation of the facts. Because if we do, we are building on the wrong foundation. If your belief that God's Word is what it says it is, is based on what a lot of men have found, you are resting on an improper foundation. Because those who oppose that view can produce their own interpretation of the same facts. But we should begin with the belief that God's Word is true, no matter what, and then evaluate all evidence that we see based in the light of that truth. We don't start from the proposition that man is true and we will test God by man's ways. We start with God being true and all things that men say will be tested in the light of His glorious Word. Rather than causing us to not care about its history, our belief that God has sovereignly preserved His Word should motivate us to further pursue proofs that authenticate the Scriptures. A second reason that it is important to study Biblical history is because God's character depends on it. Now, I struggle in how to word this reason. Because the God we serve, He's God. He's perfect. And He doesn't depend on anyone. But we read in the Scriptures that when he made a covenant with Abraham that he swore by himself because there was none higher by whom he could swear. The implications of this are that if the Lord God did not fulfill his covenant to Abraham, then he was not God in the first place. If God is not true, he is not God. Therefore, we rejoice that the God we serve is true. In the book of Isaiah, chapter 40 and verse 8, the prophet says, The word of our God shall stand forever. Amen? In First Peter, chapter 1 and verse 25, it says that the word will endure forever. So, brothers and sisters, now this is not rhetorical. Answer me. Is the Lord faithful? Yes, He is. Is the Lord true? Yes, He is. And if He allowed the Word, the Word that He promised He would preserve to be corrupted, then we would have no foundation for our belief. And unless history bears witness to the fact that God will perform what He promised, then He was not God to begin with. Now there is a temptation that we have to, you know, just accept a little bit of secular thinking in this broad range of conservative belief. Just take a little bit of what the other side says. Just admit that a few portions of Scripture were not inspired, that they were added by men. Admit that some of the manuscripts, maybe that we don't think that they bear out that they are God's Word. And maybe a few of the verses you have in your Bible, they're not real. They're not the Word of God. But before we accept this position, 
we must count the cost of what it means to do so. Because when we give one drop of the Word of God over, when we admit that it is not true, Not only do we have no basis for the truth, we don't even know the God that that Bible is talking about. You see, if what has been, if what is said in God's Word has not been preserved, we can't know what's true about God. Because in the scriptures, he de- he determines and he defines who he is. And so, if one of those things has been corrupted by men, how do we know more of it hasn't been corrupted by men? And don't we have to then rely on men to tell us what's from God and what's from man? We're reduced to needing another human mediator between God and man when we are told that there is one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Jesus Christ. And to need another human mediator other than the Lord is contrary to the very scriptures that we hold dear. Faith in the God of the Bible, is not only the belief that He exists. It means believing who He is according to His recorded Word. If God allowed His revelation to be changed by men after His Word was recorded, we have no idea what's the Word of God and what's the Word of man. And we cannot know truth. The Holy Scriptures exalt the living God of heaven as the infinite, holy, just, and merciful creator and sustainer of all that we know. And He has been made known unto us through His Spirit and His revelation of His Word. We should rejoice every time we open our Bibles because the very fact that we possess God's Word is a testament to His own sovereign and unchanging character. The story of this preservation, the history of this incorruptible book is glorifying to him because it shows that he always and never fails to fulfill all of his promises. And in fulfilling his promise to keep and preserve his word, he proves that he is the fulfillment of every attribute given to him in the scriptures. It is a testament to the glory of Almighty God, and we should rejoice in that testament when we look at the Word. A third reason that the history of God's Word is important is because the knowledge of of the history of the Bible allows us or enables us to defend it. A knowledge of it allows us to defend it. Now, we know just because we believe God's Word is true doesn't mean everyone else does. Three generations have passed since conservative denominations have backed off of textual study and have handed it over to liberal scholarship. And the result is that our culture today has no concept of the authority of God's Word. The Even the phrase, the authority of God's word, means nothing to them. If you use that in conversation with someone of the world, they will say, well, it might have authority over you, but it doesn't have authority over me. One hundred years ago, 
you couldn't even be a respectable atheist without knowing the Ten Commandments. If you did not at least have a respect for the Scriptures, you would not be respected as a human being, no matter what your religious affiliation or non-religious affiliation was. But it is difficult for us to overestimate the importance of backing away from the studying of the text of God's Word and giving that over to those who do not have as their desire the authority and the preservation of God's Word and God's truth as their primary motive. The Bible has become, in our day, just another piece of literature, the equivalent of Reader's Digest. Because to most, it holds about the same authority. In fact, we see modern magazines and books as more relevant to our lives than the Holy Word of God. And this is where you come in. I'm not referring this afternoon to the person sitting beside you. I'm not referring to your pastor. I'm referring to you, no matter how young, how old, what, whether you are male or female, whether you are a parent, a grandparent, you are single, it doesn't matter. We are all called to follow the example of Jesus. And here's what I'm talking about. Jesus was not shielded away from these type of debates. In the book of Matthew, chapter 22, Jesus was asked a question by the practicing liberals of his day. Yes, Jesus had to face liberal scholarship, just like we do today. People who disregarded the supernatural of God's Word. They were called the Sadducees. Their primary belief was that they denied the resurrection. They also denied other, as I said, supernatural elements. But they were going to ask this good teacher the impossible question. The question that others could not answer. And Jesus' response, amazed and what's more, silenced them. He answered from, beginning from the foundation of God's Word, which is where you and I must begin our reason defense of the Scriptures as the Holy Word of God. Again, it does not start with human proof. It begins with God's truth saying that it is the Word of God, and then we proceed from there to explain how all evidence is conformable to that truth. We have a responsibility to answer critics. And again, you might say, I don't come in contact with critics. This is not something I need to do. If you are a child of God, this is a calling you have upon your life to be ready to give the answer to those who ask a reason for the hope that is in you. Is there a reason that you have hope that God's word is what what he says it is? Then you are called to be ready to give a reason for that. We should study to know how God has protected His Word so that when we hear one of Satan's lies about how it has been corrupted, we can humbly, and as Peter says, meekly and in fear, answer the question. We do not answer in pride or arrogance, for that is not the desired attitude the Lord has called us to. In fact, the Lord Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not those who are nervous 
and afraid and scared of any dissension or of any disagreement. But those who are submitted to the Lord God and who do not allow their own emotions to rule them, but can reasonably, in the fear of God, give an answer, those display the signs of a true child of God. And we should strive when we are answering our critics. We should strive for this attitude. When God's revelation is attacked, again, we should be prepared to say why we believe it is true. Beginning with the fact that God says it's true. But then, giving supplemental proofs in other areas. Because if we really believe in the purity and the sovereign preservation of God's Word, when it is attacked, we will not be able to keep silent. But we will be burdened from the depths of our heart to make known the truth that God is. And man bows before the wisdom of God. For we don't glory in our wisdom, but in His. There is no lack of men and women who will proclaim the corruption of God's Word. And they will spread that toxic message to the world. That's why the saints of God are called to stand and defend it. Now I realize it is impossible for every person to study every book that has been published on the subject of biblical criticism much less read every book that answers the questions raised by all the books on biblical criticism. But it is possible to study and to know how God has protected His Word from error. It is possible to know His sovereign glory as displayed in the preservation of His Word. Now, you might not be able to answer every question a critic may ask, but a knowledge of biblical history allows you to defend God's Word in ways that very few believers can today. That's something that we should strive for. And lastly, the history of the Bible motivates us to sacrifice for the preservation of God's Word. The history of the Bible motivates us to sacrifice for the preservation of the truth. What is it that's required of those who love God and who love His Word? Is it worth giving up our lives for? Just because we have been privileged to have numerous copies of God's Word in our country doesn't mean that it is like that everywhere or that it will be like that here in the future. We don't know that. Paul told his son in the faith, Timothy, that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 15 and verse 20, if they, referring to the world, have persecuted me, they will persecute you. Our wonderful and majestic God has allowed his saints in the past to experience persecution. And he is allowing saints this very day across this wide world to experience 
persecution because they stand for God's word and will not back down no matter how strong the enemy comes at them. And what is the result? While the fires of persecution burn hotter, the word of God spreads faster. Jesus said it like this. The gates of hell will not prevail against his church. He didn't compromise one little bit in that statement, and we should not either. But this requires sacrifice. This is not something that we are called to in luxury. We have a responsibility. Just as when we look at men and women of the past in history who were willing to go through the fires of persecution, the literal fires of persecution, simply to have God's Word and to possess it. When we look at that, we must ask the question, would I be willing? Would I be willing to go through that for the Word of God? Would you forsake your possessions, your job, your comfortable life, and even your family for God's Word? Because you refuse to compromise on it in the least. Brothers and sisters, we have forefathers who were willing to die over doctrines that they held dear, that they believed were founded in God's Word. It would be very easy today to have a totally new ecumenical movement if they said, all right, if this denomination, if you will trim this belief and you will trim this belief and all come together, we won't persecute you. There would be a lot of people who would be ready and willing to let go a few doctrines here and there from their own beliefs in order to stave off persecution. This is even more than doctrine. This is the foundation of the doctrines that we believe. This is the Word of God. We should find the Holy Scriptures just as glorious, just as vital, just as precious as our spiritual forefathers found it. It should resonate within our hearts just like it resonated within theirs. They did not give up their lives for popularity. They did not give up their lives because they wanted us to talk about them and to read about them in textbooks today. They gave up their lives because they counted the Lord God and His Word more precious than temporal pleasures that they could receive. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1 says, wherefore, seeing we are compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. When it says we are compassed by so great a cloud of witnesses, this chapter, Hebrews chapter 12, is the culmination of what he is all, that the writer has already said in chapter 11, which lists all the great men and women of faith that have been used by God. And the writer says, seeing that we have this great cloud that we have just looked at, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race set before us. We have a race to run, brothers and sisters. We are not stationary. The church does not remain stagnant because we serve a living God. We are a living 
body with Jesus Christ as our head. And we are called to look at the examples of those who have gone before us to follow them in their righteous conduct. That is why within this conference, we will look at men whom the Lord has used in the preservation of His Word. It's not to fill up time. It's because we should seek to parallel their lives. We should seek to follow their examples, learn from their mistakes, and emulate their wise ways. Men like Jan Hus and William Tyndall did not count their lives as important as the spreading of God's word throughout their land. They gave everything. Are we willing to do that? Now, we talk about a calling. This is a calling. And it's not something that can be done in a few days or in a few weeks. This is a lifetime of making the glorious truth of God known everywhere we go, resting in the confidence that it, that it is God's truth and not the truth of man. These men who have gone before us were used by God within His sovereign plan to preserve His truth throughout all ages. Think about that. Do you see yourselves as a part of God's plan? Do you see yourself as an instrument in the hand of the divine potter, who just as Mordecai told Esther, how do you know you've not been prepared for such a time as this? Well, dear saint in Christ, how do you know that you were not prepared for such a time as this? this. What would motivate a person to sacrifice their very lives for the glory of God? They must, and they did, love God above all other things. Nothing was more important to them than the God they served and His revelation unto them found in His Word. This should be a wake-up call to us as God's people. Now, I do not know what the Lord will allow His children to go through in the future. But as we look back at how the Lord has used ordinary people in the preservation of His Word, we should be motivated to joyfully yield ourselves to God to be used in whatever way He chooses to use us in the spreading of His truth. You see, we don't have to fear those who can kill the body because we fear the one who can kill both body and soul. And the fear of the Lord makes us bold against the fear of men. So what do we do with the information that we learn and hopefully will learn over this weekend? First of all, the most important place you can share this is not on a street corner, although that has its place. It's not at work, although that has its place. But the most important place that you can share the spectacular history of God's Word is in your own home. Fathers and mothers, grandmothers and grandfathers, our children and grandchildren should be taught how God has kept His Word free from error. They should know that when they look at 
that Bible. It is not normal, average, everyday, man-made literature. They should know that it is the divine Word of God. It might not seem important now. They might seem to believe it just fine without you having to teach them any of these things. But I will promise you, as one who has seen the works of those in the world, your children and grandchildren are hearing from all other spheres of their life that the Bible is full of contradictions and lies. And we must emphasize to our children how God has preserved His Word lest they be overwhelmed by the waves of toxic humanism that abounds. You see, we are planting a foundation for the truth. The Spirit of God is the one who will draw our children to Himself. But parents have a responsibility to make this known that God's Word is the truth and He has preserved it. To pastors, all those of you who will be leaving here and who will be going back to the church that you serve, I, ex I exhort you to exhort your congregations to love God's Word. That's the first thing. Exhort them to love the Holy Scriptures. And then, teach them how God has preserved His Word. But don't do it until the Holy Spirit causes you to overflow with gratitude towards God. It should come from the depths of your very soul that you are thrilled that the Lord God of heaven has given you the privilege of making known the truth of His Word to them and you are so blessed by it, you want them to know why you believe it's God's Word. And to students, to those who are still living at home, you have a calling. There is a greater opportunity before you than we have seen in generations. I say that because some would encourage you to keep your light under a bushel. Just try to keep it burning and don't do anything that could possibly snuff it out. Well, I want to tell you that right now at this very point in your life, you are in preparation for bearing witness to the light of Christ when He causes you to begin your own family. Christianity is in need of men and women who will walk under and boldly defend the authority of God's truth in every area of life. That's a calling, my young brothers and sisters. And no matter who you are, that's something that you need to be wrapping your mind around whatever age you're at. This means taking every opportunity that is made available unto you to grow in godly wisdom. And we have a good example of that. Our own Lord and Savior did this. The one example we have of his childhood. What was he doing? He was speaking with elders, with those who were teachers of the Scriptures. And he was astounding them with his wisdom. Rather than settle back in the comfort of those that we are most like, I would say, expand your horizons and learn from those that might seem smarter than you, that might seem different from you. 
but grow in the grace and wisdom and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is my prayer that the Lord will raise up men and women of faith who will bring the study of the biblical text back to the church of Jesus Christ. That is a calling. But whether you are single, married, young, or old, may the words you hear this weekend motivate you to defend the Word of God no matter what enemy comes against you. In closing, I would like to read a verse from a poem written by Martin Luther that we are all familiar with. A mighty fortress is our God. But don't brush over this. Consider closely these words. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The Spirit and the gift are ours through him who with us sideth. And here's where I want to add my exclamation to Luther's words. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, this body they may kill, but God's truth abideth still, and his kingdom is forever. Blessed be the Lord God of heaven and earth. Thank you.